Hello and welcome to the Lincoln Journey. I'm your host, Grant Veter, and I'm going back to a teleprompter because, eh, it didn't work out that well trying to do it from notes, and it seemed like I was pretty boring either way, so I thought I'd go with the easiest way. So, today I'm going to present part five of The Conspirators, the story of the Lincoln assassination. Last time we talked about how John Wilkes Booth responded to news of the fall of Richmond. We introduced Secretary of State William H. Seward as a major player in the story, and we cast suspicion on Mary Surratt. On the day that Washington heard about Lee's surrender, Monday, April 10th, crowds surged around the White House, demanding a speech from their beloved president. Abraham Lincoln had made many controversial decisions during the Civil War, and his armies lost battles more often than they won them. Hence, his popularity ebbed and flowed. But a president who has just won a war is a very popular president indeed. And in the hour of his hard-fought success, loyal Americans dwelt more on his oft-described attributes of compassion, forbearance, and forgiveness than on his decisions to suspend the writ of habeas corpus, to imprison troublesome citizens, and to pursue a long war that left hundreds of thousands dead on both sides. That Monday night, he came to a window beneath the, the north portico, but he wasn't prepared to make extensive remarks. He had some thoughts that he said he would deliver the following night when he expected there to be a formal celebration. If I permit you to dribble it out of me now, he said, I will have nothing left to say on that occasion. Instead, he asked a band accompanying the crowd to play Dixie. It was a favorite song of his before the war, before it became a Confederate anthem. He joked about it to the crowd. Our adversaries over the way, I know, have attempted to appropriate it, but I insist that on yesterday, we fairly captured it. On Tuesday night, the city was bright with elaborate illuminations, bonfires, and drunken revelry. Lincoln returned to the window to deliver his speech. But rather than a triumphant salutation to his victory, he wanted to discuss the reconstruction of the nation. This was not a quick pivot from a war footing to a peacetime political initiative. With large portions of some Confederate states having long been back in Union hands, Reconstruction was already a hot issue in the White House, in the halls of Congress, and throughout the nation. But it wasn't the stuff of a glorious oration. The main question Lincoln wished to address was, can Louisiana be brought into proper practical relation with the Union sooner by sustaining or by discarding her new state government? Boring? I almost fell asleep writing that. But the speech had its moments. Reflecting on the likelihood that he could never satisfy all the parties concerned, Lincoln noted that some people were dissatisfied that Louisiana's new constitution did not allow African Americans to vote. He hadn't made his own feelings known publicly on the subject before, but now he did. Should black men be given the elective franchise? I would myself prefer that it were now conferred on the very intelligent, he stated, and on those who serve our cause as soldiers. We may cringe with embarrassment at such a sentiment from an American president, but at the time, it was an advanced position. Too advanced for many, including our conspirators. We don't have to guess at the reaction of John Wilkes Booth. He was in the crowd listening to Lincoln with David Harold, and the idea of blacks voting repelled him. Turning to Harold, he spat, that means Negro citizenship. Now, by God, I'll put him through. Except he didn't say Negro. Leaving in disgust, he declared, that is the last speech he will ever give. 
How far his detailed plan to fulfill this promise had progressed is unknown, but there is further evidence implicating Mary Surratt, the Surratt who didn't get away. The next day, Wednesday, April 12th, Richard Smoot arrived at the boarding house on 8th Street looking for John Surratt. Back in January, the Surratt who got away had procured the boat needed to spirit the president across the Potomac from Smoot and another man. However, he never fully paid them, despite their repeated efforts. John Surratt was, of course, gone to Canada and then to New York, but his mother was at home and acting mysteriously. Here I'm just going to quote the better part of a paragraph from Kaufman's American Brutus. On Wednesday afternoon, Smoot showed up at the 8th Street boarding house in search of John Surratt. The lady of the house, as he later recalled, gave him a penetrating look and curtly informed him that she did not know the whereabouts of her son. But when Smoot told her the nature of his business, Mrs. Surratt's demeanor changed. Her face brightened up and she extended me a most cordial greeting and eagerly inquired if the boat was in its place and readily accessible as it might be called into requisition that night. Then, as if suddenly reminded of something, she got an anxious expression and told Smoot he must leave at once. He might see her son and the boys on Friday night. They planned to be back in Washington by then. If Smoot's recollection is accurate, Mary Surratt was clearly involved in some mighty dangerous business. Booth's murderous plan had some amount of flexibility, judging from his actions the next day, on Thursday, April 13th, the day before the assassination. But some important changes were well on their way to fruition. Early that morning, Lewis Powell walked up to the home of Secretary of State Seward, where he saw nurse George F. Robinson breakfasting just inside an open window. In all apparent innocence, Powell asked how Seward's recovery from his frightful carriage accident was proceeding. Robinson said the secretary was getting better. Powell tipped his hat and moved on. Now here's more on William Henry Seward. As noted above, Seward acknowledged early that Lincoln would be his own top advisor. But among the president's many strengths was a deeply ingrained self-confidence that allowed him to delegate authority and to give his top administrators and generals their head in most cases, always reserving the right to overrule them if it suited him. As Secretary of State, Seward didn't run the country, as he initially hoped, and as some believed to be the case, but he frequently exceeded his brief as Chief of Foreign Diplomacy. For the first year of the war, his department, rather than the War Department, decided who would be detained without trial under the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. Seward was reported, perhaps apocryphally, to have bragged about this authority to the British ambassador, saying, I can touch a bell on my right hand and order the arrest of a citizen, and no power on earth except that of the president can release them. Whether he said it or not, Seward's little bell became a notorious symbol of the government's wartime diminishment of civil rights and Seward's prominent role in it. Thus was Seward on Booth's mind when his thoughts on kidnapping translated to assassination, and his focus on Lincoln broadened into a larger plot to decapitate the government. He assigned Lewis Powell to kill Seward, and he had sent the young giant to scout the territory. Also on Thursday, Booth took the train to Baltimore to talk to Michael Lachlan, hoping to re-involve him. But kidnapping had already lost its attraction to O'Loughlin, and murder was no more enticing. Booth returned from Baltimore alone. However, O'Loughlin probably realized there was evidence linking him to Booth that implicated him in whatever Booth attempted, regardless of his status on the team's roster. That afternoon, O'Loughlin headed to Washington with three friends, ostensibly to join in the celebration over the imminent ending of the war, possibly to try to talk Booth out of executing his plans. I tend to visualize this next episode like a motion picture. Movie makers love to have scenes of drama set against celebrations with large and high-spirited crowds, 
It helps to build tension and it makes a great backdrop. In Washington that night, public and private buildings took part in a grand illumination. Gas jets and candles were used to create pictures, to spell out slogans, or simply to decorate the night as only fire can. The Capitol Dome was so lighted that the very heavens seemed to have come down, according to one newspaper. Among those celebrating were Michael O'Loughlin and his friends. But in addition to viewing the spectacular lights and getting spectacularly drunk, Michael Lachlan had hopes of preventing an assassination. According to one of his friends, O'Loughlin visited Booth in his room at the National Hotel either that night or the next day. He was apparently begging Booth to call off the plot. He may also have considered an alternative means of stopping Booth. There was a party that night at the home of Secretary of War Edwin Stanton. Ulysses and Julia Grant were there along with a large contingent of War Department employees. An unfamiliar caller asked Sergeant John Hatter if General Grant was in. Hatter told him that he would be able to see the general from the pavement. After a hesitation, the stranger was gone. Later, Major Kilburn Knox was standing in front of the Stantons and the Grants on the steps to the house where guests had gone to view the fireworks. He, too, was accosted by a stranger who asked him, Is Stanton in? I suppose you mean the secretary, asked Knox. Yes, answered the stranger. I am a lawyer in town. I know him very well. Knox told him he ought not to disturb the secretary. But the stranger had already spied Stanton and walked over and stood behind him. He did not speak, only stood there a few moments. Then he returned to Major Knox. Is Stanton in? he asked him again. Believing the stranger to be drunk, Knox studiously ignored him. The interloper persisted. Excuse me, he said. I thought you were the officer on duty here. There is no officer on duty here, replied Knox. At this point, the stranger walked into the house, where a few minutes later he was asked to leave. Both Sergeant Hatter and Major Knox later identified the oddly behaving stranger as Michael O'Loughlin. Prosecutors at the trial, who proved themselves more zealous than meticulous in many aspects of the case, used this identification to charge that O'Loughlin was there to kill Stanton. It is much more likely that he went there hoping he could work up the courage to warn the nation's top military leaders that President Lincoln's life was in danger. Perhaps he was trying in his liquor-addled mind to concoct a story that would put the feds onto the plot in a way that he would not be suspected of ratting out his friends and in a way that would not raise suspicion as to his own complicity. That would be a tall enough task sober. Instead, he melted into the backdrop of awe-inspiring lights and euphoric people. If you're an extra in the crowd, you can watch him go, just don't look into the camera. In addition to Seward and Lincoln, Vice President Andrew Johnson was marked for destruction. Johnson gets short shrift in our history books, mostly because he was a lousy president. But nobody knew that yet. He was chosen as Lincoln's running mate the previous year in the time-honored tradition of balancing the ticket. Lincoln had bent over backwards to accommodate pro-Union Democrats throughout the war, and even created a new party for the occasion, the National Union Party. Democratic support was crucial to holding the Union together. The credibility of the new party depended on Lincoln's running mate being a Democrat. Johnson was from Tennessee. Despite being a pro-slavery congressman, governor, and senator, he still opposed secession in his state. As the federal authority gained control of much of Tennessee fairly early in the war, Lincoln named Johnson as the military governor of the state in 1862. Being a prominent Unionist leader in a state that voted to secede made Johnson the most attractive candidate for the vice president spot on the National Union Party ticket. His personality, known to be irascible and combative, was not considered in this equation. Johnson was staying at the Kirkwood House Hotel in Washington, but he was also in the National Dog House. 
bare weeks before, his behavior at the inauguration created a scandal. Feeling ill before he was to be sworn into office in the Senate chamber, he doctored himself with two large tumblers of whiskey. The result was a long, rambling, and at times incomprehensible vice presidential inaugural address. When it was finally over and the officials were moving out of doors for Lincoln's inauguration, Abe passed the word that Johnson must not speak to the multitude. Afterward, the story flew through the city and Johnson spent most of his time hiding out. So that's Andrew Johnson. Booth assigned George Port Tobacco Atzerodt to assassinate the vice president in his rooms at the Kirkwood. Atzerodt booked a room above Johnson's, but his heart wasn't in this. He resisted Booth's instructions in a meeting Thursday night at Lewis Powell's room in the Herndon House Hotel until Booth made it clear that he was too deeply implicated to back out now. As Friday, April 14th dawned, the assassination plan stood so. Booth kills Lincoln, Powell kills Seward, Harold and Atzerodt kill Johnson, all at the same hour. They could all assemble afterward on the road south to Virginia, although Powell might alternatively choose his own route of escape. The conspirators planned to make April 14th an historic date, but the rest of the country thought it already was. It was four years to the day after the surrender of Fort Sumter. General Robert Anderson, who as a major had capitulated to Confederate General P.G.T. Beauregard and took the fort's flag with him in the Union forces evacuation on April 14, 1861, raised the same flag over the bastion in the middle of Charleston Harbor on the day that Abraham Lincoln was to die. So ends part five of The Conspirators. If you have questions or comments, contact me at grantveter at gmail.com. We'll see you next time on part six. Mm -hmm.